biggest cities are amongst the fastest growing in the world. In about 10 to 15 years, every other person in Africa, i.e. 50% of the population, will live in cities in urban space. Now this rapid urbanization has spawned new narratives about urban space in Africa, and there's a general bent or interest towards looking at the problems that these cities have brought, as often cities are imagined as new, dystopian spaces and foreign in this area of the world. So while some cities, in fact, are new and stem from new economic and social relationships, there are many older historical sites. My own research focuses on the Bight of Benin, an area in West Africa where dense, thickly populated cities have been the norm for centuries, where, as Jane mentioned, I look at how coastal West Africans imagined, constructed, and represented their urban spaces in West Africa in the 19th century. So this is the area I look at, which is basically the Bight of Benin, which is the western bend in Africa. So, as a historian of Africa, one of the challenges in doing this type of work is specifically sources, especially for this period when most local information is orally transmitted and preserved. Now, however vividly historians have reconstructed social, cultural, political, or, or economic relationships in cities like Lagos, too often the city and island fade into the background, unengaged and passive in their role as landscape. In my own work, I try to reconstruct the past in place using a range of traditional and non-traditional sources to do this. Now, we know, so that's Lagos on the left-hand left -hand side, and a couple more cities that are in the Bight of Benin region. Now, we know a little bit about how Lagosians imagined space and built their city in the 19th century, and most of, the di of this direct knowledge comes from preserved individual testimonies um, oral histories through song, through proverbs, and from the myths of origin and territorial expansion in this region. What we don't have are visual representations of this changing experience from local people. So there's no evidence yet from a local perspective in the 1840s and 50s. So in expanding this analytical framework, um, I look at political competi competition and colonialism as specifically spatial projects and recast violent political acts, of which there are many in this period, as, spatial narr as specifically spatial narratives. So in analyzing the sources created to document cycles of destruction and rebuilding, I'm able to reconstruct urban spaces that are otherwise visually absent from the record. Now one way of doing this is by looking at maps as a way of measuring and mapping urban space in pre-colonial West Africa, which is why I'm here <laughs> at this panel. So I look at the ways that maps, travel narratives, and surveys together, produced in the dual arts of conquest and cartography, bring new insights into understanding the morphology of African cities, three of which I've presented here. So Porto Novo is at the bottom, and Abelkuta, another city, is in the top right corner. Um, so today, I want to highlight three or four examples of maps that allow the analysis of spatial practice as it unfolded in the 1840s and 50s in Lagos, and we'll end quickly with some of the new ways that maps can be drawn using new technologies um, available through tools in the digital humanities. So another thing that I want to talk about is sort of look at how forms that are shown in your exhibition, Roberta, have persisted. Things like maps of itineraries and things like narrative maps that still persist in looking at space in this period. So. Like a typical historian, my own archival work began by privileging texts and other documentary records. But however, as I continued my research, I began to encounter images I had, that had never been referenced in the historiography of the, this time and space that I'm interested in. Now, some of these images, as I show here, um, accompanied correspondence, while some have been extracted completely from the files or folios that are about them. So in presenting my work earlier, people have encouraged me to sort of think about archival practice as a specific part of my method. So this is something I'm trying to think about here. So as we flip through the sort of correspondence from the 1850s and 40s and 50s, you see various types of maps, sketches, formal, informal surveys. There's a whole array of maps that have been sort of ignored in the ways that historians think about space. Now, I call these maps colonial because of when they are produced, where they are archived, and who they are attributed to. In very few cases are they this, but actually in very few cases are they the products of a single cartographer or a single sort of intention. In fact, reading the text or subtext or reading between the lines as it were in these maps, there is evidence of multiple parties at work in the collection, of this, in the collection and representation of this information. There's evidence of partnerships between people who are local and foreign to the areas, as evidenced in the routes that are mapped but are not accessible to Europeans, 
but are still sort of represented in these maps. And in the mapping of specific experiences of individuals who are nowhere ever referenced in the record or in the map. So map, the map on the left is a map of um, the slave coast from 1865. So this is one of the maps sort of in terms of itineraries. The cart well, the missionary who was the cartographer in this sense took a sort of inventory of the cities along the western coast that were related to slavery. And then he also looks at the interior. I'm sorry it's not very clear or sharp, but basically he maps a lot of routes that he himself could not have possibly traveled on. So there's evidence of the informants there. On the right, we see another map that's not entirely too sharp, but is a map of one of the rivers that he goes, that he shows in his map, and that's expanded on here. Um, looking more at itineraries and plotting, we see evidence through time of people plotting actually cities um, in terms of landscape, we see Ouija, we see Badagu, we see Popo. So there's all kinds of series of these maps that have not been exploited in terms of thinking about space in Africa. Another map that's particularly important for my work is comes from the 1850s, and this is one of the very first maps of Lagos that we find. It, the, and interestingly enough, it's actually not a map of Lagos, it's a map of the river, because the British were thinking about how to navigate and get into the interior and also how to do certain things in terms of um, bombing and violence and the things that I mentioned that I sort of rethink spatially. So this is the first map of Lagos that we see that actually represents the space as lived in, in the Arab. And then another map that we see here, it comes from a little bit later, and then I've been able to sort of collect um, different representations of the island and region here. The last map I'm showing to continue this trend in ter is when I look at it in terms of propaganda and presentation, this is a map of Lagos from 1885 that was shown, that was drawn and shown in the Colonial and Indian Exhibition as part of a sort of propaganda about British imperial power around the world. So these kinds of maps are ways of accessing urban space in West Africa. So if we think about maps um, like other visual sources that have been recognized as socially constructed interpretations of reality, that are, quote, argumentative in orientation and therefore, quote, specifically propositional by nature. We can think about these maps and surveys and the ways that they sought to represent different parts of the Bight of Benin and other parts of Africa. So if maps can and do tell stories, what can colonial cartography tell us about urban space in pre-colonial Africa? So one of the things, so I'll just go through this part pretty quickly. These maps share many characteristics and are striking, not only for what they show, but also what they omit, quite in opposition to the detail in the maps that we've seen earlier. So first of all, they share a visual language that foregrounds the Cartesian qualities of geometrically planned European space. There are significant absences, let me go backwards. There are significant absences and blank spaces that paper over indigenous settlements. So specifically here in this map, the older cities where the African populations lived are often blank in all the maps that we see. So the, these absences and blank spaces that paper over indigenous settlements as the maps often lack a visual metaphor for what is local or African. It is here that the uh, documentary record complements these maps and allows one to narrate as well as visualize these spaces that people lived in the 19th century. Of course, there are multiple sites of tension in analyzing and combining the documentary and visual evidence, as it is not until 1885 that the map of the city is presented as full, or should I say fully inhabited. But despite what is reflected in each of these maps, we know from the documentary record that the city was in fact densely populated, and that beginning in the 1850s, land was increasingly scarce and increasingly valuable. So, um, so for historians of Africa, like myself, the excitement and possibilities triggered by using applications like GIS is tempered by the question of sources. So there's a whole sort of trend now to think about these representations of space. How can we map them on the quote, ultimate map, Google map, that's sort of a, supposed to be the accurate representation of the world. So on the left is this 1885 map that I showed, and on the right is the current, well, a few months current version of um, Google Maps of Lagos as it is now. So one of the things you can do is sort of georeference these maps and think about how to plot space based on what you know and what you don't know. So, um, so more maps sort of, I'll move to this one for now. So, so these issues of using these new applications are tempered by questions of sources yet again. How do we reinterpret these sources? How do we assemble them? And how do we deal with the ever-present question of mediation and the masking of local agency? The first and most 
immediate risk comes from the nature of the sources themselves, as these maps, charts, and sketches that lend themselves to these exercises are almost always exclusively produced by people who are not familiar with these areas. So how does spatial analysis move us beyond well-worn schemes that plot power along specific axes of race, space, and technology? How can we use these sources without reinscribing old ways of seeing the world, or new ways also? How useful are these data-hungry tools, for instance, in circumstances where empirical data is uneven or sparse in the period that I'm looking at? So for me, one way of doing this is thinking about turning the maps inside out and subtracting what we know is European and focusing on next page, spaces within the boundaries of what seems unknowable or unquantifiable. And by looking at these areas and using these new technologies, it becomes possible to plot the past in place in Africa. Thank you.